but all parties at that point in time agreed to that. Uh, quite candidly, both sides had submitted proposed orders at the court group, and the court was of opinion that neither the order submitted by the plaintiff nor by the defendant was accurate of what the court had ruled. So the court, on its own, of course, drafted an order, and based on that fact, it was, uh, though the telephonic camera was on May 14th, the actual order itself was not uh, executed until June 1st at that point in time. It was filed by the court and I have found, and I did send copies or uh, email or even fax, I don't recall which, but at any rate, sent uh, copies to both sides. Uh, I think at that point in time, there's a, a, a possibility uh, that additional counsel had not been joined, but be that the way, uh, that order has been circulated to all of them. And uh, in that order, the court ruled that uh, the defendant had, uh, at any time prior to the convening of the selection of the jury, which was to begin at 1 o'clock today, to file a motion to reconsider. And that in any case, as I appreciate that, is not for the court. All right, Mr. Murphy, you want to uh, argue? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Next. And by the way, let me say that I had read your uh, uh, motion in uh, the exhibits, but I want you to be able to make that record. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Your Honor. Uh, when we had our telephonic hearing back on uh, May the 14th, Your Honor, you uh, advised that uh, uh, you were not granting our motion uh, uh, for some judgment and dismissal and or an alternate for the joiner of the city of Jackson. You know, and you also, uh, uh, based on Mr. Uh, Reed's argument, you asked that you, you, you stated that if I could submit some law, uh, state showing that the court had, uh, uh, that the rules applied. Mr. Reed's argument the rules didn't apply. And if I also uh, uh, show where the court had authority to Dismiss this matter. I need to present the same. Uh, Your Honor, uh, this uh, today I filed the uh, I filed a motion to reconsider, you know, and uh, and uh, to reconsider the uh, course finding on May 14th, and uh, suggest and we we were presenting that the defendant's motion for summary judgment and to dismiss with prejudice in accordance with Mississippi Rules of Civil Procedure 56B and 12B6. Is a legal issue to be decided to be decided by the court. Uh, our position is that that this court has uh, the power to rule in favor of uh, the defendant and should have ruled in favor of the defendant against the allegations uh, that Miss uh, that the plaintiff made in her petition for election contest because in her election contest, although she mentioned many irregularities, she. There's no mention of whether or not there was any fraud by, uh, by anyone or intentional wrongdoings, Your Honor. And further, uh, the, the Mississippi Supreme Court held in Slaughter v. Collins that mere technical irregularities in the casting of a balance are not grounds to invalidate absent uh, evidence of fraud or intentional wrongdoings, Your Honor. That's paragraph number five, uh, page two, Your Honor. And, uh, it's our position that here, as a matter of law, the plaintiff failed to state a claim upon which relief can be, grant, can be granted in her petition and in her response to pleadings, Your Honor, because in her response to pleadings, we specifically asked in uh, paragraph 7C and 7E whether or not uh, the plaintiff knew in fact or had any knowledge or any evidence about our client, Ms. Stokes, the defendant doing having any uh, 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 doing any wrongdoings or had anything to do with any wrongdoings, and they uh, specifically in their response to the discovery request in paragraph uh, eight and twelve, in their responses eight and twelve, they specifically on uh, interrogatory they specifically said no. They said no. All and uh, we have attached as Exhibit A a copy of their petition, which uh, set forth what they asked. What the plaintiff stated about Ms. Stokes having a work, saying that the Stokes, saying that uh, the worker on behalf of Ms. Stokes, and uh, in 7C and 7E, and that was addressed in their response 
uh, in the negative. And that was in their response uh, to the you know, to defendant's discovery in Iraq terms in response number eight and response number 12. Father Young, uh, when asked and uh, request, re the defendant's request for admission, uh, when asked specifically uh, about, uh, asked about uh, uh, the defendant having any culpability, uh, the plaintiff specifically admitted in her response that defendants, in, in response to the defendant's request for admission number one, that plaintiff has no knowledge of the defendant committing any of the allegations listed in petition in, in her petition for election contest. So they pretty much, you know, although they filed a petition for election contest, they pretty much came back and said they had no proof whatsoever that anything against Ms. Stokes was done wrong by Ms. Stokes or uh, uh, on behalf of Ms. Stokes. You know. Now, they also failed to mention anything in their petition, Your Honor, about any allegations of fraud or any allegations of intentional wrongdoings. Now, in uh, the defendant's response to the discovery, they list a whole lot of names of a whole lot of uh, people and uh, uh, workers, poll workers and city managers, Your Honor. But it's, there again, they still, when they were asked specifically to state what uh, that these uh, particular witnesses will be giving testimony about, Your Honor, they, they put nothing forth say, showing that there will be any type of uh, 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 testimony given documentary or, 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 or verbal that shows some type of uh, intentional wrong or some type of fraud. Uh, and uh, we ask that the, uh, we again ask that uh, the motion for uh, dismissal, summary judgment dismissal be granted, uh, For the plaintiff, uh, Mr. Reeves, uh, on our on the hearing, at our hearing on the 4th, he argued that this court had, uh, didn't have jurisdictional authority to uh, dismiss this case because uh, because of case law, uh, this court uh, 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 do not dismiss cases. It's supposed to dismiss cases. This is supposed to go to the jury for the jury to decide. Well, we understand that the jury have a right to decide matters of fact, you know, but at this juncture, we are here talking about the issue of law based on uh, Rule 56 and uh, 12, Rule 12, you know, Though, which is a, a legal issue about what uh, the, based on the sufficiency of uh, what was put forth in the petition and the pleadings, Your Honor. We ask that we, our position is that it should be dismissed, Your Honor. And uh, Mr. Reed also made an argument that missing rules of civil procedure do not apply in election contests, Your Honor. Uh, there again, uh, the case law states different, Your Honor. Uh, rule 81A4, Mississippi Rules Civil Procedure, uh, in the case of Shannon B. Henson, Your Honor, it, uh, it makes clear that practice and procedure in election contests are governed by statute. Of course, they're governed by election statute in the first instance, and that Mississippi Rules of Civil Procedure control only to the extent that our legislature, legislature has remained silent. So for all those matters in which uh, the election statutes do not address, then missing the rules of civil procedure apply. And, and, and that being the case, Your Honor, uh, uh, missing the rules of civil procedure 56B uh, and missing the rules of civil procedure 12B6 apply, Your Honor. And, and, and the uh, legal sufficiency uh, of their petition for election contest and their response to pleadings to discovery, Your Honor, uh, they failed to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. We're asking for a summary judgment in that, uh, to that effect, and that this matter be dismissed with prejudice, John. All right, Mr. Reed. <clears throat> and please, the court. Uh, we're here on a motion to reconsider the denial of the summary judgment motion. And, uh, as I've heard, the gentleman's argument, he didn't advance any argument that he didn't already say in the first year. In other words, You've already heard all of it, denied it. He's now just basically saying, rethink what you said or what you did and, uh, and, and, and kick us out of court. Uh, didn't produce anything to it. Uh, judge, I stand by my, it, it, it doesn't really matter what the lawyer said. Uh, what Mr. Reed said this and it's irrelevant. What matters is the law. The 
lawyers can argue what they can argue, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that's not a basis for you to do or not do anything because the court ultimately is going to follow the law, no matter what the lawyer said. But I did properly state the law the other day, and uh, I agree with him, and I said that the other day, that the court certainly can throw somebody out of court on a matter of law. Yeah, the case law says that. Well, that's, no, that's always the case. But I don't think the court can throw you out on a summary judgment motion on a matter of fact, because the code involved 2315-951 sets forth the procedure for an election contest. It's in the code. 2315-951. And it says what to do. And we've done what it said to do. We have met all the legal particulars in filing the complaint. Uh, we've done everything the, the code said to do. What it boils down to is, Ms. Jackson says things happen. And they say things didn't happen. Well, that's a classic case of people needing a jury to decide. And, uh, for example, in, in the complaint itself, we allege, um, and I'm just going to paraphrase these, I won't read the whole thing, that there was campaigning done within 150 feet of the polling place. And there's case law on that. The case law says that you can't do that. In fact, there's a case that says when it's done, it's a grounds to set aside a warrant. And we allege that that was done. Now, they may tell you it wasn't done, but we say it was done. And who's going to decide that? A jury. You have, the court hadn't heard anything to decide whether it did or didn't happen. Also, we say that voters were assisted <coughs> improperly. Now, we have alleged in the complaint clearly that voters were assisted in voting when the law doesn't allow it. The law allows voter assistance in three cases, Judge. If the voter is blind, disabled, or illiterate. And even in other cases, the voter has to first ask for assistance. You can't just assist voters because you want to or because they want it. They've got to ask for it first. And then uh, the poll worker has to determine is the voter blind, unable to punch the buttons on the machine, or illiterate. And even if the voter asks for assistance, if he's not blind, disabled, or illiterate, he can't get assistance. Can't do it. They have to go vote himself. We put all that in the complaint and said that was going on. Voters were assisted without following the law. We also said that one of the poll managers used a racial slur, which unfortunately I've got to bring that up in, in front of the jury. A, a terrible racial slur. My client is, uh, is of mixed heritage, African American and Caucasian. And uh, we have proof. We're going to have sworn proof. We put in the complaint that uh, her racial heritage was used against her in, in, in polling place, in the polling place. And in fact, uh, she was called a half-white in the N word. And that's just awful. Uh, there's no room for racial prejudice anywhere, but certainly at the ballot box. And we have that in the complaint. Uh, voters were instructed to push here in certain instances. Uh, the machine is in. Uh, we have in the complaint that uh, campaign workers for candidate Stokes were positioned, they positioned themselves at the entrance to the polling place and exhorted voters to vote for Stokes as they entered the room. And the polling managers didn't stop it. So we have, have we have a fact specific complaint, uh, which which it says in there what happened. Now, of course, they say, well, it didn't happen. Well, that's what lawsuits are about. One guy says he ran the red line. The other guy says, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Who decides that? Does the judge say because they say we well, didn't run the light to kick him out of court? No. The jury decides that. So we, we have alleged, judge, enough facts to create a genuine issue of material fact. They did not, when they filed their motion, they didn't accompany it by affidavits. There are no affidavits. You know, typically in a summary judgment proceeding, the moving party submits affidavits. There are none. It's just a motion with some discovery attached to it. Now, on discovery, the gentleman pointed to some discovery answers. We did what you told us to do. Uh, the rules of procedure, Rule 26, does not require a party to. Uh, say what a lay witness is going to say in court. It only requires you to say what experts say. 
But you wanted us to go a step further. But we complied with the rule to start with and gave your names, addresses, and phone numbers. They wanted us to get a brief summary. You said, John, just give a brief. Just enough so they'll know what you're going to allege. We didn't have to give a synopsis, I mean, a, 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 a whole thing about what they're going to say. We just gave a brief summary of it like you told us to do. So we followed the court's instruction on that. Uh, We, we've elected not to be in court, Judge. We, we've set forth the case that the jury needs to decide. Okay, Mr. Burton. You know, again, in the plaintiff's response and their discovery pleadings, they were specifically asked, please identify any and all person who witnessed any occurrence related to any issue raised in, the, in this civil action. And it further went on and asked that, please list all these witnesses that you may call at trial, and uh, it asked to identify the names and telephone numbers of those persons, and Identify each document, photograph, picture, videotape, or any other tangible thing which they had to support their allegations, Your Honor. There was nothing in plaintiff's responsive pleadings stating or supporting their case which would allow summary judgment not to be granted, Your Honor. There was nothing in their responses which stated, which uh which stated that there was a particular candidate or that there was a person working on behalf of a particular candidate or that there was a particular manager or somebody there that actually was involved in any irregularities to the point that it would cause the will of the people to not be known. Our position is well, when they answered their discovery, they were supposed to in response to their petition for election contest, they were supposed to set forth the name of all of the, for each allegation that they had in there. They were supposed to set forth at least one, at least two names of somebody that committed some of these irregularities or was responsible for it, John. Without that being done, they can show they, they can't show any intent. They can't show any wrong doing, intentional wrong doing. They can't put on proof of any kind of fraud. They didn't. They didn't even allege fraud or intentional wrongdoing in their pleading, y'all. We ask that some judgment be granted, y'all, in accordance with and, dis and dismissal in accordance with Rule 56 and 12B, y'all. Particularly in light of the fact that the prior motion was heard telephonically without this record, I'm going to make absolutely certain both sides have had an opportunity to put everything in this record concerning their position in this, and you have done so at this time. I was remiss in not announcing when I began this record that I'm here serving by special appointment of the Mississippi Supreme Court on the order executed by them on the 26th day of March of 2012.